before we begin with the lesson, I think it's uh, very necessary and a very worthwhile thing to just, uh, uh, this week especially, thank those of this congregation who have served in our military, uh, those who have served in wars, and just let you know how much we do appreciate you and we love you for that and not just you but everybody else who has served this country we're not being over dramatic when we make this statement there are people who would love to keep us from doing what we're doing right now and because of you and so many others who are able to do this in freedom and we thank you for that and we thank god for that we are so glad to have uh, visitors with us today. We have a lot of visitors. Some of you are here to visit family members. We're so grateful for that. Uh, others of you are here because uh, Tiffany Howard is going to be showered this afternoon. <laughs> uh, they're bridal shower, and we're so glad that you are here. Others of you are here from the community, and we are especially glad to have you with us today. We really are, and we, and we hope and pray that you'll be made to feel that way. Some of you, uh, this might be the first time you've ever attended a church service. And we are most grateful for you. Don't want you to feel ashamed of that. Don't want you to feel embarrassed about that. And uh, maybe it's been a long time since you've been to a worship service. We are so glad that you are here. And if you have any questions about anything that we say or do here, you may be wondering, why do we... Why do we pass crackers and grape juice around? Ask us about those things. Uh, we'll be glad to uh, talk to you about those types of things. Any question you have, we hope that you'll feel comfortable enough to answer those or to ask us those questions. Also, uh, we have a Bible correspondence course that is available. And we have two wonderful people who take care of that for us. And we'll point you in their direction. If you would like to take a free Bible correspondence course, uh, let us know. Let anybody here know. We'll point you to the ones who can, who can make it happen. Uh, you can take this in the privacy of your own home. You can fill it out, mail in the answers. Uh, that will be graded. And the next set of uh, material will be sent out to you. And you can do this in the privacy of your own, own home. Maybe that's a way that you would like uh, to study as well. Anything that we can do to help, we want to be uh, willing to do that for you. Which brings us to our lesson today. For the past several weeks, if this is your first time here, you're getting in towards the conclusion of what has been a, a series of sermons on the church. And from what we've learned so far, just to uh, paraphrase and to, to try to catch you up as best we can in a short amount of time, uh, we've learned several things about the church and we've been reminded several things about the church. For instance, we learned that the church is not a building. Uh, it's the people that worship inside of the building who are the church. The church is not a denomination. And I know this is confusing, especially in our day and age, when there are so many different uh, denominations, so many people who would call themselves Christians, yet they teach different things, they practice, practice different things. Uh, one says this, another says this, and it might be very confusing uh, to try to understand that and to wade through that. And I understand it is. Uh, but as we've been in this series of uh, sermons, we've seen that the church that we read about in the Bible, he only built one church. And only those people who practice the commandments of Christ can claim to be part of that one body uh, that he established. And so we've learned that. We've talked about that. We've learned that the church is bought by the blood of Christ. And so if you are a member of the church... You have been purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. It has been those who have heard the word, they believed the word, they repented of their sins, they confessed the name of Christ, and they were baptized into Christ to have their sins washed away. And at that moment, the Lord himself, the one who died to purchase you, added you to the body that he promised to build. He added you to the other group the group of the redeemed. And that's a wonderful and beautiful thought. We've also seen that the church is not just the leadership of the church. Sometimes you might hear it said like this, well, you know what? The church needs to be doing this. 
The church ought to be doing that. And sometimes they, by that they mean, well, the elders got to, ought to start this. The, the preachers ought to do this. The, the um, deacons maybe should do this. Well, what we've learned so far, if I am among that group in the redeemed, I am the church. And so when I'm pointing a finger, it says the church needs to be doing something, I'm pointing a finger right back at myself because it's my responsibility as part of that. We've learned, and two weeks ago we asked this question, the church, now that we know that the church is that body of all redeemed, placed into it by Christ himself, we asked this question, okay, I'm redeemed, I've been purchased with the blood of Christ, he's added me to the body, he's added me to the church, so now what's the point? What do I do now? Do I just sit here? Do I just come, sit on a pew, and just wait to die, <laughs> to go to heaven? Well, no. There's a point. There's a purpose for the church, and that's what we've been studying. The first thing, if you remember, we noticed is that the purpose of the church, the purpose of the saved, is to save others. If you've been saved, your purpose is to teach other people what you did to be saved so that they can be saved too, they can be purchased with the blood of Christ, and that Christ himself can add them to the group of the redeemed. That is your purpose. And then, Lord, uh, last week, we also followed that up with this. We help save the unsaved. And number two, your purpose is we try to keep the saved safe. We try to encourage one another. We edify one another. We, we encourage one another to stay faithful, to continue running the race, continue to fight the fight. Don't give up. We encourage one another. That's why we have Bible classes. That's why we call when someone's sick, when, when someone leaves for a while. We say, Is everything okay? Don't give up. You need, you need to keep fighting the fight. And so your purpose, if you are a member of the church, is to help keep the saved safe. The third thing that we want to notice today, and then we'll follow this up with a very similar lesson this afternoon. The church, what's the point? Is to help those in need. We evangelize, we edify one another, and then thirdly, what's the point? To help those in need. This is not an elder's responsibility alone. It's not a preacher's responsibility alone. If I'm a member of the church, my purpose is to help those in need. And that's what we're going to notice this morning for just a few moments. But there's some questions that we need to ask as we begin this. Number one, who are those in need? Who are those in need? If you have your Bible, turn with me to Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Luke chapter 10, verse 25, a very interesting question is asked, and a very uh, interesting parable is given. As a matter of fact, if you were to ask uh, most people's favorite parable, the first one would be the prodigal son, and number two would be the good Samaritan. And this is the question, and this is the, the, the context of what precipitates that great uh, parable. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Listen to what happens as he comes here. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What shall I do to inher inherit eternal life? Look at verse 26. He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? Good question. So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. So this lawyer repeated the law back to him. He already knew the answer. He repeated the law back to him. Verse 28, And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. But he, verse 29, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Now, we have to be aware of this question, especially when it comes from a heart like this lawyer had in this, in this context. Just who is my neighbor? We have to be careful, just like this lawyer was trying to do, that we don't ask this question as an excuse not to help someone. <laughs> as an excuse not to help someone. We are people... If we have been redeemed, our purpose is to help those in need. And oftentimes, like this lawyer, rather than helping people, and I don't jump ahead of me and think, well, we got to help everybody all the time, no questions asked. Don't get ahead of me like you did Greg this morning in Bible class. Stay with me. Don't get ahead of me. 
Uh, we don't just help everybody without asking questions, but we have to be careful that we don't have this same attitude looking for reasons not to help somebody from the very beginning. That's what this lawyer was doing. And who is my neighbor? And it's at that point that Jesus tells him the parable of the Good Samaritan. We won't read all of this because this is just the first point. But you remember what happens. Uh, there was a man who was robbed and beaten, left for dead. Then you had the religious leaders going by, passing by, and the other side of the road wouldn't do anything. But then this Samaritan comes by in this parable, and he is the one who helps him. Who is my neighbor? Look at verses 36. And, well, let's, let's back up. We've got to read some of this. What does he do? Verse 34. He went to him, bandaged his wound, pouring in oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he was departed, he took two denarii, gave it to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? Boy, he puts it right back on him, doesn't he? Look at verses 36 and 37, and he forces him to make the answer. So which of these do you th three do you think was neighbor to him who fell? Verse 37, he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. He couldn't bring himself to say, well, the Samaritan. Instead, he said, he that showed mercy on him. He was a neighbor to these people. And so see the emphasis Looking at others, well, I don't want to help him, I'll help him. Don't want to help her, but I will help her. I'll pick and choose, and then I'll, when I'm in the mood, then I'll pick, yeah, I'll help. When I'm not in the mood, no, I won't help. But what does Jesus do? He puts the emphasis back on the man himself. You see, it's my attitude. One who was always, always willing to help. The person who was a neighbor was the one who was willing to do good to others. Now, there are some questions that we do need to ask. These are legitimate questions. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. Now you can catch up with me. This is where we were going. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this. If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. Yeah, there are some people that take advantage of the system. They take advantage of generosity. They take advantage of good and honest Christian people who could have a job, who could work, who are physically able to, to help, um, that just want to mooch off of others. Well, here's a passage that shows us if you find someone like that, that person needs to work to provide for himself and for his family. And so if you come upon someone like that, you don't have an obligation to help him with whatever he is asking. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 3, honor widows who are really widows. And then First Timothy 5, verse 16, if any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them, and do not let the church be burdened that it may relieve those who are really widows and so we have someone here we have a widow who is being neglected if she has a son or daughter they ought to take advantage of of their mother's benevolence to them in the past and take care of her take care of her and make sure that she's provided for that is their responsibility so the church doesn't have to help well you might say well what if they're not taking care of them well, then we have an obligation then we are to help but at first ought to be the physical family and so there are some legitimate questions. We're not just taking, we, saying we just pull uh, in, our, in our pants and, and get all the cash we have and just throw it out to anybody who's standing on a corner with a sign. That's not what we're talking about. But our attitude should be always willing to help. Listen, when there is a legitimate need, friends, it's our obligation as Christians when we have the ability to take care of that need. Now, keep in mind what I said. It's not the elder's job solely. It's not the preacher's job solely. As I go about my daily life as a Christian, I look out for others to whom I can be a neighbor. 
I used to have a very illustrious job when I was a young man. I was a bus boy at Shoney's. You can laugh, but it was a great job. That's where I met my wife, so it did have some advantages to that. Uh, and that's a great job. It really was. It was an honest job. And anyway, I said all that to say this. Sunday night, we would get a particular group of people in, and uh, they would come about 10 minutes before we closed, which was never a favorite of any of us who were trying to get out of there. And they were from a particular church. It wasn't the Lord's church, it was some other one, but you know, to other people who don't know any better, one is just like any other in, in their minds. And the waitresses would say, oh, I don't want to wait on these people. I had them last week. It's your turn. And you want to know why? Not because they were overly rude, but because they didn't tip worth anything. So here you have somebody performing a service for you, working an honest job, who is dependent upon our benevolence to help them. What kind of person do we look like if we're some of the stingiest people on this earth? It ought not be for a Christian, should it? Number two, who are those in need well, we've answered that. Let's look at the second part. This is my favorite part. The first church, the early church, helped those in need. Imagine this, Acts chapter 2, verses 44 and 45. Now all who believed were together. Now just, just imagine this happening and what an impact it would have on the world who saw this taking place. All who believed were together and had all things in common, and they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. When there was a need, what did they do? Hey, I got some. Take it. What do you need? I've got it. This brother's got it. This sister has it. Let's pull our resources so that we can have a collection for those who are in need and make sure they don't have to go without Acts chapter 4, verse 35. Now, uh, nor was there anyone among them that lacked. Think about that. Any among them that lacked for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. That's a beautiful sight to behold, isn't it? Romans chapter 12, verse 13, distributing to the needs of the saints given to hospitality. Now, this is my favorite one coming up. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. This is a passage that we know, and oftentimes we focus on one part and we neglect another part. Watch it. Let him who stole steal no longer. Boy, there's a lot of sermons in there. You have a thief. He obeys the gospel. He no longer steals. That's a power of the gospel, and we love to talk about that, and rightly so. But rather, let him labor. Get a job. We talk about that. Working with his hands what is good. Watch. This is the part we don't often see. We focus on, well, don't steal anymore. Get a job. Get a job. Do something worthwhile. And that's not a bad thing to preach. But watch the purpose for our job. Watch it. That he may have something to give him who is in need. Why do you work? Well, I want another car. And so in order to do that, i got to keep working and hopefully I get a raise. Why do you work? Well, one of these days I'd like a bigger house. And again, I'm not saying any of these things are wrong necessarily. Why do you work? Well, you know, I've got this, I've got that. I need some new clothes. I need, I need this, I need that. What if our attitude was this? I need to have a job. I need to prosper as much as I can so that I have something to give to those who are in need. You see, that changes everything, doesn't it? That changes my attitude. It makes me be a neighbor to other people. It makes me realize, hey, I've been blessed. For what purpose? So that I can be a blessing to other people. What a concept. 
And thank God he's shown us this in his word. Titus chapter 3 verse 14. And let our people also learn to maintain good works to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. And then James chapter 2 verse 16, one that scares us a little bit. And one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? You see, the difference in the attitude, you have one who looks at life as, I've got these possessions, I've got these blessings, I have this income, and I'm thankful to God that I have this income because that means I can help more people. And the more money I have, the more people I can help. And then you have the opposite attitude of one who really does not want to give up anything that he possesses. Instead, someone comes to him, oh, I'm so sorry that's happened, brother. I, I, I know that you're doing without. I know that you are suffering. I know your family is going hungry. Oh, boy, that bothers me. Let me pray with you. Let me pray for you. Oh, just go and I pray that you'll be warmed and filled. I have some of the things that he needs and refuse to share. I'm not fulfilling my purpose as a member of the church, as a New Testament Christian. Watch this, 1 John 3, 17. But whoever has this world's good and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, watch. How does the love of God abide in him? You know what the answer to that is, don't you? It doesn't. God saw a need in us. We were lost in our sins. No hope. What did he do? He gave. The only gift that would fill that need. That ought to change us, shouldn't it? That ought to change me from the inside to the outside. I've been given a gift when I was desperately in need. I could never dig myself out of that hole that I was in spiritually. And at that time, God gives a gift. While we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. That ought to change us. That ought to change our whole attitude. That ought to change how we look at everything in life. Family relationships, people we come in contact with on a daily basis. It ought to change how I look at possessions. It ought to change just my whole attitude toward life. Instead of looking at myself and out for myself only, now I'm looking to help other people. Why? Because that's what Christ did for me. What are needs? I know this is basic, and I know <laughs> that probably all of us know this, but what are some needs? When you come in contact with somebody, what's, what's a genuine need? If I came to you and said, hey, uh, would you mind, Tom, giving me a loan? Well, what you need it for? Well, I've only got enough for one Big Mac at McDonald's, and I'm wanting two. Eh, you might say, Mark, you don't need to eat, be eating two Big Macs. I don't think I'm going to give you that money. Now, if I come to him and I say, Tom, can I have a little bit of money? Why? Because I haven't eaten in three days and I'm hungry. Food. Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. That was a pivotal time, and I know in one way, there's no way that they could have, they didn't have enough food to feed all of those thousands of people that were there. But he shows them responsibility. Don't send them away. Feed them. Feed them. That's what you ought to do. Look for opportunities to feed them. If someone is hungry, if someone genuinely needs to be fed, feed them. Here's some ideas, and again, these are just things to think about. You, you can come up with better ones than I can. And I know that you may 
not like part of this, and I can understand in some ways, but if you're there in a grocery store and you see somebody uh, who looks very poor, and I know that's a dangerous thing to judge by looks. I, I, I get that, but sometimes you can tell, can't you? You, you can just tell. And they are uh, paying for their food. Maybe they're using food stamps, which is a wonderful blessing to those uh, who need it. And you see them, and you have some extra money. Have you ever thought about just sliding your card and, and paying for that person's groceries? You think that would mean something to that family? Have you ever thought, you see somebody in need as you go and get yourself something to eat, just get them something to eat as well, or maybe go buy some extra groceries, just taking them to people. Oh, just no special occasion. Had some extra, just wanted to drop it off. And, and if we all started doing that type of thing, not only would people notice, and we're going to talk about that this afternoon, but we would be fulfilling our purpose. You see, we're looking for opportunities to help rather than having to be asked. Number two, shelter, physical help. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn and took care of him. There is, again, the good Samaritan. Shelter, physical help. He saw somebody who was obviously... In, in need of physical help. So what did he do? He bandaged his wounds and he took him to a place where he could have shelter. Other needs. On the next day, did you catch this? When he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said to them, take care of him and whatever more you spend when I come again, I'll repay you. Anything else he needs, take care of that and I'll repay you. When I come back to you. So these are needs. Food, shelter, physical help. Other needs that you see along the way. Well, why help? Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. We won't read all of this. But boy, it'd be a great thing to do tonight on your own. Just take some time and read it. And let this sink in. You remember when Jesus... And I can just imagine their faces when he was reading to them. Because they obviously took it literally. When he says to them... When he's departing the sheep from the goats, he tells why some are going to be sheep, some are going to be goats. And he says to them, well, why are these people saved? Well, uh, when I was, or why are they lost? When I was in prison, you didn't visit me. When I was hungry, you didn't give me anything to eat. And he goes through this list of things of people that did not do for him. Those are the goats. But then he talks about the sheep. When I was in prison, you visited me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was hungry, you gave me food. I will say to that group of people, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And his disciples say to him, Lord, when did we see you? Don't miss this. When did we see you in prison and visited you? When did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we see you thirsty and give you drink? And you remember what Jesus says, As much as you have done to the least of these, you have done also unto me. Have you heard that the way we treat others Christ takes personally when I feed someone else Christ takes notice when I'm a friend of someone in prison rightly or wrongly does not matter if I'm a friend to him if I care about him if I have genuine concern about him and and or her Christ takes notice of that. When I'm a friend to someone no one else wants to befriend, Christ takes notice of that. When I give somebody food, when I give somebody something to drink, when I fulfill a need in somebody's life, Christ takes notice of that. And listen, he takes it personally. And so when I help someone no one else will help, I'm helping Christ. When I love someone nobody else will love, I'm loving Christ. Can you imagine if we, as the Lord's church, opened our doors to the people the rest of the world has no use for?
Man, we can make a difference, can't we? The overlooked people, read the gospel accounts. And you'll see, those are the people that Jesus was concerning himself with on a daily basis, was it not? The people the world overlooked. We can't overlook them. Why? Because our Savior did not. Why help? It's a command. Why help? It is compassion. As you read the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Every once in a while you see something, although this is not the main purpose of the gospel accounts, but, but, you, but you read and you see something that's absolutely so beautiful each time. Number one, think about this. Those ladies who gave money to finance the ministry of Jesus. Did you know that he was funded a lot by women? They sacrificed so that he could do what he did here on this earth. And then at the cross, remember when the soldiers were going to part his garment, but they saw that it was woven through without, it was the garment of a common man, not store-bought, but, but made by the hands probably of a woman. And then when I think about that little child that comes up to Jesus as an innocent child would, and he takes him and puts him on his lap. This is my point. This is where I'm going with this. Don't you love when you just read those, those, those verses in passing of those times when people showed care for our Lord? Doesn't that warm your heart? Because His whole purpose was to come here and to show concern and compassion for others. I love just those little tidbits that you read where somebody showed kindness to my Savior and I want to go back in time and just tell him, boy, Mary, thank you so much for feeding Jesus today. Thank you so much for making him a garment to wear as he goes and he travels about. Thank you for buying him a pair of shoes. And all of these things, when you show compassion to others, as we've said, it's showing compassion to Jesus. And I love that thought, don't you? It's command, it's compassion, and it's an opportunity to give them their most needful need of all. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those who are of the household of faith. As we close this lesson, we bring it to a close. Here's what we want to get from this lesson. Church, what's our purpose? It's to save the unsaved. It's to keep the saved safe. And number three, watch, is to look for opportunities to show the love of Christ in giving to those who have genuine needs. When's the last time you thought of reaching into your wallet giving money to someone you don't even know, when's the last time you thought of that as an opportunity? <laughs> and I got to admit, that's tough, especially when you know how hard it was to get that dollar in there in the first place and to give that to somebody you don't even know. But what's this verse tell us? Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all men, especially those who are of the household of faith. Our challenge for this week is to look for opportunities, and not just for this week, but for the rest of our lives, to try to get our hearts to the place to where we realize why we have been blessed, and that is so that we can be a blessing to other people. That's our purpose. This morning, if you are not yet a child of God, we want to give you an opportunity and that is to become a part of the family of Christ. Do you believe with all of your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? If so, are you willing to repent of your sins, those sins for which Jesus died? Will you confess with your mouth that He is the Son of God? Will you be baptized into Christ so that those sins can be washed away? 
when you do that, there's action in heaven, as we've talked about in this series of sermons. The Lord himself adds you to the body of the redeemed. You're saved. And if you're looking for purpose in life, it's found in Christ. And it's found in his church. We have purpose in life. You want a purpose? Come be a part of us. Come be a part of us. We can help you in any way. We stand ready to do that while together we stand and sing this invitation song.